Good morning, Pete. Good morning. Thanks for having me. I'm glad you made it for the, the blizzard. Although, you know, this is a blizzard for Nashville standards. Before you laugh. <laughs> Yeah, I, I live in Colorado, and we just yeah. got 38 inches of snow last week, and I'm like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I don't know why people are freaking out around here, but <laughs> it's. So I live out in the country, and it's they don't solve where I live. So once I get on a main road, I'm fine. But to get there, and everybody's going like five miles an hour, it's fine. It's not ice. It's just snow. We're cool. But yeah, it's. Don't know how to handle it. The song you're here to talk about, and which is the title track of the album that you released last year, is Walk the Water. Yes. Uh, talk a little about that. So the whole album, this whole thing just came out of, um, you know, it was really just momentum from our uh, single that Cactus and Winona and I did called Hearts I Leave Behind. It went to number one on iTunes and it really kind of rolled into this next album and we were originally going to try to finish our first EP and then before we knew it we had 12 more tracks and we had a whole new album and Walking a Wire being the, the you know, actually it was the last song we added and it was at the last minute and it really was, um, you know, the song itself is about um, a, a guy sweating a girl in a bar which is you know that could be anywhere in the world uh, it was a really cool fun tune but for me it was more of a double meaning it was it was I felt like the entire time I've had a music career I've always walked a very fine line because of my past uh, and I wanted to make sure that you know what I put out there was not only reflective of me and and you know what I was going through and it was personal and I could sing to it and talk to it but also it was reflective and my my old teammates would be proud of me and proud to be pick up the CD and be like, hey, this is our guy. Yeah. And so I always felt like, and especially with publicity and everything, I was like always walking a wire. So it, it's uh, Dirk Bentley and David Lee Murphy wrote it, and you know, Dirk's actually said that to me. And he said, you know, this it's kind of neat that that track is, you know, the name of it because it. And uh, I was like, wow, he he got it right away um, because he's a, a big military supporter. So um, it was, you know, it's. It's a it's a catchy tune. It's it's probably the most mainstream song we have on the album. Everything else is is a, I think more Americana, a little off the beaten path. Um, but um, yeah, I mean that's called Walking a Wire. It's a great. I I love it. It's one of my favorite songs to play. It just it feels good and you're happy happy playing it. So. And I bet it's something that resonates with people, even if they're you know they don't have a military career or they're not doing music. Yeah. It's something that. Well, that's what I wanted. My I wanted this entire album, and I wanted wanted my whole body of work because I think we all learn the same lessons in life, just in different verticals. You know, I think it's all the same. You know, you're, you're, it's a personal journey, it's a relationships, it's it's life in general, and you learn those lessons in whatever professions or vertical you choose. And so I think if you can, if you capture and you have music that can highlight those, um, and they have your your through the, through the glasses which you see things um, then you can connect with people who kind of see that but if it, I didn't want it to be like um, all, all military it just wasn't you know like those lessons are the same lessons you just you have to learn you have to be able to communicate it in a way that crosses those boundaries um, and I wanted people to be able to look back and be like hey did you know he used to do that and that weird um, I didn't want it to be something that was out front Well, you're, well, you're nervous. You know, I mean, it's the same feeling that that, that you know, trepidation, that, that nerve, where you're you're giving something to the world that, in your mind, is great, and you know, you put your heart and soul into it, and then you're you're gonna serve it up to the for public consumption, and you know, people can just absolutely crush it, and that's a part of you that you know you, you there's like a it's a fine line you have to walk because you have to kind of, you know, uh, uh, you have to give yourself away to be a good artist. You have to be that that vulnerability to like pour it out there. And I've I've always seemed to find that like when you when you give it away, the more you give away, the more you get back because the more people they recognize that vulnerability and they want to have that. They want that in their life because there's a certain freedom that comes along with being vulnerable. Um, because, you know, one, yes, you're giving yourself away and people can criticize you, but again, there's, I think, I think people envy that, um, that strength, um, because they want you to, they want to have that. 
I think it's why, you know, Winona Judd is like my big sister, and she's the reason I have a music career. And I've spent so much time with her and watched her on stage and watched her with fans and watched her on Oprah. And, you know, and one of the things she is is she's open and vulnerable all the time, and people adore her for that because they see everybody can find a little bit of themselves in her. And so that's what's beautiful, beauty, the beauty of art, whether it's, you know, visual art, you know, whether it's music. Um, whether it's poetry, whether it's writing, it's people want to find, they want to find companionship in that, um, not just physical or in emotional companionship, but they want to find that intellectual connection. Um, you know, they, like there's a certain community of, um, there's a certain community that grows when you, when you can share experiences and, and people connect. But it's, and you mentioned Winona, who's a fantastic example, and one of the, the more, in, in, current like you know, pop success stories would be a doubt. Yeah. You know, she writes it. Oh, she's amazing. Leads her heart onto the paper. <laughs> I love her. Sings it and you know people sell a jillion records. It's not a coincidence. No, it's not at all. And I think that's the I, I, I'm hoping that country music is getting back to that. I, I think we went away from that. You know, like you can only sing so many songs about a dog and a pickup truck. Uh, and you know and getting drunk and, and like there's only so much you can say about that right. you know that's cool and fun and people yeah, want to party right and I and I think you know it's like you you lose people lose respect for the genre I mean pe- country music is country music because you tell stories because you you connect with everyday people around the world it's con- now I look at country as this evolution and country means to me the country it's American music it's you know it's connecting um, across the board uh, so I think that I hope it's getting back to that where you know you can you can sing and write and you know and connect with people and it's not just this superficial hey I want to get drunk on a Friday night and forget my problems like that's cool we all want to do that and everyone wants to go dance have a good time but when you're sitting alone in your car you know and you're driving somewhere or you're on a plane and you put your you know your headphones on and you go into that place like you want something more you don't just want that you know so there's I, I, I'm hoping we go back in that direction where you know the Chris Stapletons of the world get uh, get their day as well so. and you, you made a connection before that I think is super super important is when you said you can find you connect vulnerability with strength oh yeah and that is 100% vulnerability is not weakness vulnerability is strength is courage so that path of being creative means making yourself vulnerable which means doing it anyways and having courage how has that grown in your life how do you think about it? well I learned that as a and this is where the connection I learned that as a SEAL officer um, when I was you have to be if you think you walk into a room and you know everything and you're the you know the best of everything you lose everyone in the room um, and if you're going to go into battle you, everyone in the room has to be on the same team they got to want to fight together they got to want to die together uh, showing that vulnerability and saying I don't know this I need help um, especially when you're in a leadership position gives it builds bonds and strength that you are going to test to a level that's never been seen before on the battlefield. It's that brotherhood, it's that sisterhood that is just beyond anything you can put into words. And the key I always found is, and is, is a, being a leader is to show that vulnerability because that builds a bond with somebody else who can fill that hole. Um, and I, and you know, and I've that's how you. That's that's why men fight. That's why women fight. That's why you go to combat. It's because when you're you have that together, you can't. It's hard to find anywhere else in the world. And that's why music. I think was a natural. I, I was drawn drawn to play music and draw to write and draw to sing because that's that same bond you can build with people that you've never even seen before. You don't have to walk on a battlefield. You can be vulnerable and you still have that connection to other people. And that's what it, you know. People ask me what I miss about being a seal it's my brothers i miss being in the room with them I, I miss that love that we have for one another music allows me to recreate that with a larger audience maybe not to the depth but you know when you meet somebody who's you know says oh my god you know especially like the song hearts i leave behind met so many people who just were like i need to tell you about what that song did for me and to me that's just like that's the same thing you know coming in from a crazy, you know, crazy battle, and, and you're standing next to the dude, and it's just like, wow, man, 
thank you. You yeah, totally you stepped up. You had my back. You were there for me. It's that same feeling when you can't replicate that. Um, you can't replicate that unless you have that vulnerability and, and you're willing to give everything away, then everything comes back to you. And it's the, the metaphor that gets used to explain yeah. vulnerability yeah. by um, one of my favorite researchers is the idea of the arena. You walk into the arena mm -hmm. and you're showing up. That's exactly The man in the arena, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's not, the, not the critic who counts. It can be um, whatever your arena is. Like my arena is you know, a particular thing, right? Maybe I have three different arenas going on at any one time. Mm -hmm. But people's arena can be you know, their personal life, something that they're struggling with, or it could be, I need to make a career decision, and that's my arena right now. Uh, and I think that's why when you said, people ask you about, oh, you went from military to this, and this is different. And in my head, I'm, when I read your bio, I was like, oh, this makes perfect sense to me. Because it is the same thing. Because it, and the reason it's the same thing is because it's still, it's about human beings. Yeah. And, and, and we all have arenas, and we all know exactly what we're talking about. Well, life... You know, war is life on 11. I always say that. I use a metaphor from, from Spinal Tap, you know? Like, this amp goes to 11. Right? It really is. War is life. You know, when he's going, when Nigel's going through the, the amp, and he's like, it goes to 11, just so if you need that extra oomph. And the guy goes, well, why, don't, why don't you just make 10 louder? And he goes, because this one goes to 11. Like, like that, like, I don't need, why do you even ask that question? It goes to 11. Like, how did you not get that? And I try to explain combat. Like life, you have these young kids that get shoved in this, and it's emotions on 11, it's fear on 11, it's love on 11, it's it's vulnerability on 11, it's all these things. And then, you know, you, you get jammed through all these life experiences in such a short time, and then you come home, and it's life on two or three. And you've lived at 11. And so now you are you spend so much of life trying to unpack that. You know, it's there's a book called The Things They Carried. I read when I was at the Naval Academy Prep School. And it was written by a Vietnam veteran. And it was he was talking about things they carried in their rucksack. But it was really a metaphor for the emotional baggage he carried as he came home. And so, you know, you have this experience. And how do you parlay that? How do you... You know, show people and, and make a connection with people so they can understand what war is like and what, what those, you know, you have all these great lessons you learn and you can give so much back to society, you know, and these kids, but they come home and they're not really understood because they don't know how to express what you and I are talking about. And so art and music is such a fantastic medium to do that because you, you, can, you can give everything into, you can put everything into a painting you go to the National Intrepid Center of Excellence, it's a, inter, it's a holistic, integrated healing facility um, for traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress. They spent a month there, and they have art therapy and music therapy. Guys who have never painted anything in their life, you'll see these hardened warriors go in, and they have these masks, and they paint these masks, and it is, and they've saved every single one, and they're all on the wall in there, and you can sit there and stare at this, and it's such an unbelievable, um, you know, uh, Melissa Walker, she's the art, art therapist there, and they also have music therapy. And it's this unbelievable visual, like, here's war from all these people's mindset. Here's what being, you know, uh, wounded means. And you'll see these guys who are these hardened warriors go in there, and they they spend days making these masks and this art, and they all of a sudden they just they find a way to get it out. And it's a visual representation of that. And that's that, because you can walk in and like, that's that vulnerability that, yeah. Hey, I'm not an artist, but I'm going to go create art. I'm not a I'm not a musician, but I want to create music. I just happen to be lucky enough that I grew up as a musician. And when they said, "Hey, the best thing you can do to heal your brain is to write music and engages your whole brain, increases blood flow, increases oxygen." So write, and it'll help you with your emotional stuff. And I was like, "Well, I've already known that. Like, I've been writing music my whole life. I grew up doing it." But then it's you know for them to connect it in a clinical setting, like this is good for you because. And you're like, okay, this it's like it's almost full circle, you know. It's like here's the touchy feely stuff over here. Well, here's the empirical data. And when you and you go, oh wow, I already I always knew it was true. I knew because I knew, um, but I didn't. You know, people would look at it and go, oh well, you don't have proof. Like, I don't need proof, but here it is now. Exactly. And, and that stood out to me is but I recently gave a talk on um, creative songs. Yep. And I used actual brain scans. And I got like, so it's literally like, here's your brain. Yeah, functional, yeah, functional MRIs. We didn't have that. We didn't have that. We didn't know. We 
like it was, we all assumed creativity was one thing in the brain, and now, you know, oh, no, good, it's something else. Like, now we have, we yeah. can show what's really going on. Um, one aspect, when I work with people, there's several things that keep coming up again and again, and one of the things that comes up the most is patience. It needs to be patient. If you want to pursue something related, especially music, <laughs> you're going to need to stay patient. How do you... How do you handle that means the stipulation and all the reach for those goals? It's, it's, well, it's funny because a lot of guys that have been injured, uh, so there's a lot of comorbidity between post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury, and one of the things is attention. But there's a handful of things that allow you to, to focus your brain and, and really kind of regain that because it's, it's an injury, so it's, it's anything else. It's practice, and you have to go back and learn it. Is when you are invested in writing um, a song, you know, this this album, the, my first EP, I wrote half of this album. I didn't write. I wrote. I had you know, I made some changes here or there. And part of the reason I did that, I picked songs that were reflective of me. But from a learning standpoint, I when you own something, when you make it yours, then you have to crawl inside the mind of the person that wrote it and crawl inside their you know their conscious and figure out what melodically what were they thinking. So for me, that was how to learn how to become a better songwriter was, well, well, let me crawl into the minds of great songwriters that wrote on my stuff, you know, wrote the stuff that I'm playing right now. And as I did that, you know, we, had this, we have this way of learning in the SEAL teams where if we want to learn how to skydive, we go hire the best skydivers in the world. You want to learn how to, you want to, learn how to dirt bike, go hire the best dirt bikers in the world. You want to learn how to drive, go hire the best drivers in the world. And you know, crawl inside their mind and then, then learn it and then pull it out and then figure out how to teach it. How, how what they're doing fits in with what you already did and what you did. And if you can teach it, then you can replicate it. That's when you really know how to do it. And so for me, this was part of that process. Let me let me crawl inside of the mind of these guys. Let me own this. And then now as I'm writing to finish my, going back to finish my first EP, which will be an LP uh, hopefully by the end of the year, go back and take those lessons and try to apply it and, and come out with something that's all mine or 90% of mine because I'm, you know, I, so it's it's I think it's an evolution, but when you get into it and you have a passion um, passion for something, that that's the key to any kind of learning. You have to have that passion because you're going to fail. Exactly. Life is just life is just a whole bunch of failures. I always tell people when I give my lectures, when I do public speaking. I'm like, there's only one thing that I'm better at than everybody in the world, and that's failing. I can fail faster, harder, and more dramatic than anyone. <laughs> But on the other side, I can pick myself up and because I'm like, okay, all right, I can make adjustments. That's what you learn on the battlefield. Like, you, everything you do is wrong, you know, but hopefully it, hopefully you can adjust faster and, and, and come out on top uh, faster than your enemy. Yeah, that process of the in-between that you know, face-down moment, like you, you made the wrong decision and you realize it, that, yep. re that moment of realization sucks for everybody. Yeah. But if you don't have that, then the, you never the grow. The difference is how long it takes you to get to, okay, here's the lesson I learned. Like, how, how the, has that shortened for you? Well, there was a guy called, uh, his name is Bill Boyd, and he was a fighter pilot, and uh, he came up with this thing called the OODA loop. So, and that's how he taught dogfighting. And he'd never been, he's never been beaten. He's, he's gone. He's, he's, he's dead now. But, um... Bill had never been eaten, beaten in a dogfight, and he always he would teach. He taught the Air Force's Top Gun School. <laughs> yeah, airplanes. Uh, he was an Air Force pilot. He was a fight, fight fighter pilot. Yeah, not a dog. It was a it was a fighter pilot. And so when two when two planes get in a fight, it's called a dogfight. This isn't this isn't a Michael Vick episode. <laughs> But what he said was, so here, and it's a very simple thing, it's called the OODA loop. It's a observe, uh, orient, decide, act. And he goes, the faster you can close that loop, because every time the plane would move, he would observe, he would orient, where am I in relationship to what's happening outside of my plane? I would orient myself, so observe, orient, decide, what am I going to do, then act. And then the other person would move, and then he would, you know, OODA loop, OODA loop, OODA loop. He goes, the faster you can close that loop, the better you're going to be at anything you do. So it wasn't just a, it wasn't just for you know fighter pilots. It was you know the battlefield in general, in life in general, because everything's dynamic. So you have to be conscious of, and I think the listener that you have to be conscious of everything around you, where you are in relationship to everything around you, and whatever your goal is, how you navigate through that. And you know it's it, the 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 uh, the music industry right now is like. 
so dynamic and fluid, um, you have to, you know, you got to observe, orient, decide, and act. And, and if you don't do that fast enough, if you don't do that fast enough, then you're going to get crushed by the machine. Okay. And you can take this as wide as you'd like, so it doesn't have to just say with music. Um, when you no, 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 that's fine. make a decision, then later on you have to look back on it and go, you know, okay, maybe that wasn't the right thing. Mm-hmm. Um, what usually gets you into that situation is that things like patience, uh, being too eager, so making a decision too quickly, um, listen to bad advice. What are, what are the kinds of things that... When you have to circle back to a decision, what happens? You know, they did a study a long time ago. Failure is, there's never, usually failures happen in threes, um, whether you're looking at a, a plane crash. And they're usually just, they're, they're, they're um, omissions. Usually it's three omissions in a row cause catastrophic failure. And you can pretty much trace every single catastrophe in history back to three major omissions. Uh, uh, there's a you know uh, I think this Malcolm Gladwell he wrote um, oh, the 10,000 hours well it was uh, uh, God what am I thinking was it was talking about the Korean um, uh, what's the name of the book but it was Korean Airlines they had the worst oh, safety yeah, record yeah, yeah. and there was not only was it you know it was cultural all the you know the cultural yeah, issues they, they were afraid to speak up because right. their superior officer. but there's usually three omissions in there that led to that yeah. catastrophic failure and so I, it's it's never one thing um, but it's being conscious enough to recognize like if you're not recognizing all the information and all the things that are coming at you and you choose to see things the way you want them to be instead of the way they are uh, yes. and then you start omitting you know you omit things then you are you are destined for failure on a small scale or a large scale. So I think the the, 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 the challenge becomes in life in general is is to be um, connected to it and um, observant and, and but also have that confidence in, in yourself. That's where that courage comes in to go, I'm, I don't want that to be what it is, but it is what it is. And if I, if I choose to decide that I'm not seeing what the truth is, then that's one omission. And so where are you going? And then usually it's the next one, the next one, and then before you know it, you're in a bad place. And I don't care how good you are at it, we're still emotional people, we're still human beings. We want certain things, so there's a human component to it. It's not mechanical, it's not computer, it's, it's, this, it's an X factor, it's, a, it's, you know, it's you know, this dynamic environment you, we all are engaged in um, or not engaged in, and that's another omission. Exactly, it's this, one of the things that I, I see, and also, you know, there's also the data on that now, is that uh, we do anything to get out of this kind of Yeah. So we make decisions too quickly, or we make this, whatever the next thing is, just to not stay in this moment. And I think that's a lot when people look back on decisions. What, what I say in my talks is when you make a decision and later on you think, oh, what was I thinking? Well, you weren't. If you have to ask that question, it means in that moment. Yeah, you weren't engaged. There was actually no thinking going on. There was, yeah. I just don't want this. I'll just yeah. make a big decision. That might not be right, but I just don't want to it. And it's human nature. You know, it's like you can try and you can oh, you can fight it. And done. it's yeah. and that's <laughs> and that's where that, you know, I think that's where that struggle and art comes from. Because yeah. it's like we all have that struggle. So yeah. how do you how do you get done. it out? It's no, yeah, it never ends. It how do you filter feedback? Um, because you can't take everything in because you would go crazy with a hundred thousand people. Right. But right. you need to keep the creative criticism, the, the constructive criticism. That's going to help you get more. Right. Well, how do you filter who <laughs> whose opinion <laughs> comes to it? Yeah, please. Not I think, ignore, but you kind of go. Yeah, I'm not going to. Well, I, I, that also goes back to human relationships. I think you, when people criticize me or whatever they're doing, I there's a, there's always an element of truth in everything, whether you want to recognize it or not. Um, and you can, th- so the, the criticism you choose to take in is the strength that you have. And w- what is it? You know, like, I, I think that was what you know. The, the criticism that's coming in that's going to hit home the, more, the most is the one that hits at truth that maybe you haven't recognized. 
Um, so you have to be strong enough to recognize, okay, like, yeah, I got to do that. You know, I, I, you can hear on all sides. It's like, you know, do I choose to hear the one guy who says, hey, your music's not ready? I'm like, okay, why are you saying that? Okay. And the other side is, this is where everything's going. This is amazing. Of course, I'm naturally going to go in that direction and go, well, I want to I want to hang out with this guy. I don't want to hang out with that guy. But you go, okay, you know what? There's a part of me that thinks maybe it's not ready. I, I've been only been doing this for so long. So why did, why did you say that? Not out of anger, but instead of just saying, um, and I also think the best criticism comes in the form of a, and I used to tell my guys this all the time. I'm like, you can bitch all day long. You can complain about everything on planet Earth. Go for it, but don't bitch without a solution. Don't come into my. Don't come in and be like, "Hey, that was screwed up." Well, yeah, I probably know it's screwed up, but what are we going to do to fix it? Yeah, don't just bring problems. Don't bring problems. Bring solutions. And so when people criticize, I think the the, the best criticism comes with, "Hey, listen, here's what I think. I think your music isn't ready, and here's why I think that." And you can go, "Well, okay." Then you can have a discussion. You can meet. And I think it's, this guts goes to our politics right now, what's going on in the country. What? You're an idiot. You're an idiot. You're an idiot. You're an idiot. Well, that, that only goes, okay, that's fine. There's no discussion. Instead of saying, okay, well, I think you're wrong. Hear the facts as I see them. Put them on the table. Go, okay, well, I will agree with what you said, but I think this is wrong. And let's, let's talk about it. And let's find, let's figure out how to move forward. Um, so the criticism that I take on board personally is a criticism that I know is coming from somebody, A, who cares about me as a human being. Like, they may have another agenda. Yeah, your record sucks. Okay. Well, oh, that's funny. You've got an artist that's in the same situation as me, and they're putting on an art. Like, yeah, it's a competition thing. You know, whatever. Your sucks. Or, yeah, whatever. But it's the people who really care about you will come out and say, this is what I think is wrong, and this is what I think it can be better, and this is how we can, this is what I think you should do. And then I'll take that on because if there's an element of truth that I recognize, even if I can't speak to it, um, and you know the person is genuine, then you can, and you take that on board. But it's just, I think it's like. <laughs> well, I, I, I tend to end with um, a much lighter question. Okay. <laughs> just after therapy, right? Um, is if you have to put together the soundtrack to your life with songs that you grew up with, songs that are important to you, songs that, I have songs that are my friends, you know, I hang out with them when I need them. Uh, what makes the record? Okay, yeah. Ah. Uh, ooh, God, that's hard. It's so, uh, <laughs> um, I got just I love music in general. Um, oh, it can be a box set. It can be a box set. You know, there, you know, the, the uh, so many Eagle songs, um, so many Stone Temple Pilot songs, uh, so many Waylon Jennings songs, so many uh, Winona Judd songs, um, so many Metallica songs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that. Uh, I hear you know. God. I mean, I could sit here all day and, and, and do that. Um, you know, it's it's so hard to pick. Uh, so many Pearl Jam songs. I grew up in that grunge era, and uh, you know, you know, Stone Temple Pilots and Pearl Jam. That always pushed me into wanting to perform, and um, you know. But then also, that's why I love the whole country music because there's so many great storytellers, and and that. I love telling stories and I love that communication method. Um, oh, God. What else? Yeah. I was going to say, it's, it's, I gave you more genres than anything else. Yeah, that's, but. That's, and I always say um, it's hard to do because you kind of think, well, okay, what genre am I limited to a genre? What kind of mood am I in? Like, what yeah. are we talking about? Like, what type of music? Okay. I could do that after. If you gave me a week for that project, yeah. I could come up with a box set. <laughs> Here's my list. Yeah. Big by City. And it's growing. <laughs> always. Yeah. Because it'll there will be more stuff next year because new stuff's released. Yep. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.